You are listening to Radio Free Humanity, the Marxist Humanist Podcast. My name is Brandon Cooney. And I'm Andrew Kleiman. This is the Marxist Humanist Podcast, so it was only a matter of time before we had an episode about the founder of Marxist Humanism, Raya Dunevskaya. Today we talk for the hour with Anja Clard, who worked closely with Raya Dunevskaya for many years. You'll of course recognize Anne's voice if you're a frequent listener of the podcast. Anne reads our Who We Are statement in every episode, and she has also been our guest twice before on Radio Free Humanity on our episodes The Tanky Craze, Part 1 and 2. To hear more episodes of Radio Free Humanity, read more about the issues discussed, or to join in the conversation, please visit MarxistHumanistInitiative.org. Please also consider making a donation there on the website. While our podcast is hosted by Marxist Humanist Initiative, the views expressed by the co-hosts and guests of Radio Free Humanity are their own. They do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of Marxist Humanist Initiative. In just a moment, we will be discussing Raya Dunyevskaya with Andrew Clard. But first, as we do in every episode, Andrew and I will take a few moments to discuss some recent news. So for the current events section of our podcast, we're going to be talking about a piece in Vox by Zach Beecham. came out on April 10th. It's called Why Bernie Sanders Failed. We thought this would be a good jumping off place to talk about the failures of the Sanders campaign. Um, Andrew, do you want to summarize the piece for us? Uh, I can try it. This is before any uh, attempt at evaluation. He begins by saying that the Sanders campaign had a perspective to to win, uh, a strategy that was based on the idea that Sanders' so-called unapologetically socialist politics would unite the working class and turn out young people at unprecedented rates. This informed the strategy of the campaign from the beginning. It failed, and this this defeat, along with the defeat of Jeremy Corbyn uh, late last year, um, huge defeat, uh, is a hammer blow to the left's class-based theory of winning political power. Okay? And that strategy that they had is uh, out of date and mythologized. Uh, it's a mythologized and out of date understanding of blue-collar political behavior, which assumes wrongly that a portion of the electorate is crying out for socialism because of their class interests. And he says, you know, in actuality, Class conflict does not dominate the American political scene, and uh, Sanders did not do well with black voters for reasons that are not class-related. He says, uh, I'll quote, quote, It's hard to overstate how central the theory of Sanders' popularity with middle- and lower-income whites was to his campaign and its outside supporters. And they believe that Bernie Sanders could reach Trump voters uh, and that he could do so on the basis of a social democratic agenda and that that's what what uh, at least a good portion of Trump supporters uh, would respond to, that they were, you know, anti-neoliberal, and that that was, in fact, the, the core of um, you know, their attraction to Trump as well. Uh, Beecham says Sanders did well, he says, with young people, got, you know, majority of their votes and stuff, but not enough to get young people to turn out uh, in large enough numbers to, to make the election uh, go, go differently, make the, the race for the nomination. So then he sort of summarizes all this once again and, and makes three points about why this theory of uh, Sanders' path to victory failed. One is what he calls a Marx-inflected theory of how people think about politics, which is that they should behave according to their material self-interest as assessed by Marxists, in other words, their class interests, but that's not how, you know, most people think about politics. Second, Sanders and his campaign, they assumed, um, were popular with the white working class because of him and his policies, okay? Um, So that, you know, again, that these these folks are assumed to be anti-neoliberal, recipient social democrats. And third, he says, Sanders' theory rested on a misunderstanding uh, of the way identity works in contemporary American politics. In other words, their prime identity category is class, and that's not particularly salient in American politics. And then the whole rest of the, the article expands on that last theme. And adding on to the second uh, conclusion that he makes, he you know, points out that it's now becoming clear that, you know, the Sanders campaign presumed that its 
success in the primaries among some constituents like working class whites in 2016 um, signaled some endorsement for his policies, but really was just an anti-Clinton vote. Yeah, Sean McElwee, who was a, a Bernie guy, but he's a statistician. You know, he, he, he looks at the numbers. Uh, I believe Beecham quotes McElwee to say, quote, the white working class voters that Sanders won you know, in 2016 were mostly anti-Clinton voters, he, uh, McElwee told uh, Beecham. So, so let's take a look at this piece and you know and respond to it a little bit. I, I assume we're going to want to talk about this. You know, the, the piece tries to label Sanders' uh, politics and his approach as being Marxist or Marx-inflected or Marx-influenced or something. Let's put aside whether or not that is an appropriate way of you know attaching Marx to Sanders' campaign. And just talk about the piece's analysis of the failings of the Sanders campaign and see if it, you know, we agree. I mean, in a lot of ways, the things he's saying here are things that MHI sort of warned about in our pamphlet, Resisting Trumpist Reaction and Left Accommodation, a couple years ago after the Trump's victory, that there were, there was a tendency for the left first, the anti-neoliberal left, to uh, assume that 2016 had opened up some big political opportunity for the left to mobilize around economic populist proposals and that this was going to be sufficient to fight Trumpism. And, you know, we were warning back then that this was uh, failed for a lot of reasons. For one, that the, you know, votes for Trump weren't really anti-neoliberal votes. They were just xenophobic, you know, mot- motivated by authoritarianism and xenophobia and that you weren't, you weren't going to win those Trump voters by appealing to them with specific policy proposals. Even if people might have might poll and poll, you know, in polling and say that they support this or that progressive policy agenda, that has nothing to do with the the way people, you know, turn out to vote and their loyalty to the Republican Party or to the Trump brand. Yeah, you know, I think that point is extremely significant because the, the Sanders people keep coming back to this point, refusing to, to learn it. In, in other words, you had Sanders and, you know, he gave a speech, and, you know, at one social distancing began. And he says, we've won the ideological battle, but we're losing the electability battle. And that's a distorted way of getting at something which is very real, which is, you know, when you put things like Medicare for all and, uh, you know, free college tuition, various proposals like that, you ask people whether they like them or not, and, and you do so in a sort of abstract way, they get a lot of support. But these things don't have the importance to the, pe- the most voters and people who are answering these questions that they do to Sanders and his crowd. They're, they're, they're not the driving motives of voting behavior and so forth. So it's not that they're winning an ideological battle. It's that the ideological battle that, the, that is taking place is between them and some other people. But but it's, it's, it's not salient for, I would suspect, you know, a large majority and certainly a very large minority of voters. So the, the whole issue of electability is that it's tied to the issue of, of ideology is that people are not really being attracted and, and have not, except for a small core of people. They're just not down with this, you know, resurgent social democracy. So, yeah, we've been we've been warning that the Trump's base is is not driven by an opposition to neoliberalism. You know, it's racist, it's misogynist, xenophobic and so forth. I mean, that's not probably the reason most of the, the working class whites that voted for Sanders in 2016 did so. But uh, when even McElwee is saying it's an anti was an anti Clinton vote, that again does go to the issue of people are not being attracted by the social democratic stuff the way the, the, the Sanders. Bases. So they're imagining that they've got uh, a base of support that uh, they've ne- they never had, and that came back to bite them. The thing that doesn't really come up really too much in this piece, but the other dimension to the Biden, I mean, Biden's just crushing Sanders, just humiliating him in these primaries, uh, you know, in states where Biden had no campaign offices and had run, completely run out of money, just crushing Sanders across like every demographic and like rural and urban and, you know, every group of people. It's especially yeah, especially yeah, black yeah. people and especially non-young black people. Absolutely. So, you know, one thing that doesn't come up here is just the fact the, the way in which almost every election and everything is can be seen just a referendum on Donald Trump. And the way that I think a lot of voters just said we do not have time to make this election a referendum on social democracy or health care or make this election about, you know, taking over the Democratic Party. But the only thing we can prioritize right now is like the life or death issue of removing this lunatic from the Oval Office before he kills us all. Right. 
Right. That's and, you know, really the corollary. It's, not like, people were, yeah, it's yeah. not like people were like rallying around Joe Biden because they love him as a candidate. You know, I mean, I think probably most people voted for Joe Biden probably share some degree of ambivalence or even disgust with Biden. But it's really just a referendum on Trump, not a referendum for Biden. And Bernie Sanders was trying to make this whole election about something else that wasn't Trump. Right. And that's precisely what happened in Britain as well. Yeah. The election was about Brexit. And because of Corbyn's ambivalence about the whole European project and the visions within the Labour Party and, you know, among its working class so-called constituency, they tried to pivot the election be about, you know, a turn to social democracy. And it just wasn't. Uh, and so they, so they got crushed. And this parallels are striking, right? They are yeah. polling and saying, oh, look, the majority of people in the UK support, you know, the national health system. So we'll campaign on that. And they got they got smashed. Yeah. So that's the thing is they, they get high favorability for all of their stuff in the abstract. And they think that therefore, you know, it, it's 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 a road to victory. The, the fact that they, they don't come to grips with this, it's not a driving concern when the issue is Brexit. It's not a driving concern when the issue is Trumpism. Let's talk about the piece identifies standard strategy with Karl Marx. One of the most painful parts about the Sanders campaign is just it's always referred to as the far left or it's sort of characterized as people who want gradual change versus people who want radical immediate change and so there isn't space made and the and the and the way people frame the standards as this radical socialist there's never any space for some sort of alternative to bernie sanders that might actually be uh based around the philosophy of Karl marx yeah that's viewed as the left and and the idea that there's something to the left of this it's not there yeah and so when you criticize Sanders, people just assume that that means you've sort of capitulated to some sort of centrist politics. Um, yeah, you're a neoliberal show. Fact that, yeah, rather than the fact that perhaps there's some, some deep problems with Sanders' politics and that there's very little relationship between what Sanders is doing politically and, you know, what Karl Marx's philosophy might suggest for a, a revolutionary politics. You know, I think that basically Beecham has accurately characterized Jacobin think. It's rooted in trying to win power for themselves, people like them, on the basis of economic populism, and it's very economistic, economic determinist theory. And instead of saying, you know, basically Jacobin think is effectively dead, you know, it's Marx inflected theory and class politics and stuff is, is supposedly dead, according to Beecham. Uh, I think that that's the problem. It, it is, is he's, he's got something very right, but he kind of buys their line that, you know, that their politics is, is Marxist politics, you know, having something to do with Karl Marx. Jacobinism has been substituted in for Marx. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember, you know, Marx ever writing about how to win election campaigns in the United States. You know, I mean, he had a theory of class struggle. And I don't think that the, what he meant by class struggle was social Democrats winning electoral campaigns in, in U.S. elections, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, we're going to have to leave it at that. Um, that's it for our current events section today. And up next, our conversation with Andrew Clard about Raya Dunyevskaya. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Anne. And you worked with Raya Dunyevskaya for many years, and we'd like you to share your reflections about her and her legacy. Um, this isn't the first time you've been asked to do so, right? Oh, yes, uh, you're right. <laughs> uh, I worked with her for the last 22 years of her life. In other words, I joined her organization uh, in the mid-60s when I was in college and worked with her to the end, not all the time being in the same city, mostly not, but in the life of the organization. And a few times I spent some weeks working directly with her when she was writing books and other things, and, and that was really, really a thrill. Uh, yeah. And I've been asked to discuss it. There's a video on our website called um, Raya Donevskaya, The Biography of an Idea. And that name was our suggestion to the filmmaker because of her insistence that her biography was the biography of her ideas and not personal. So she rarely spoke in public about her personal life. But when I worked with her, she said a lot of things. And I can't resist telling certain personal information as well as the serious stuff. Yeah, well, that certainly sounds like an invitation uh, for us to ask what she was like. 
Oh, she was very warm and loving to the comrades. Um, people adored her. But she had a terrible sense of humor. Um, she wasn't born in the U.S., and her, maybe it was her English that made her think that, like, Dean Martin was funny. Um, <laughs> she was she was brilliantly insightful. She saw the world through the lens of Marxist humanist philosophy, and that's the way she expressed herself. She was completely dedicated to ideas and to working out ideas, and it's that second part that's so important because many people say they love her ideas, but they don't want to work on them, and so it's they're useless just, just lying there being appreciated. I could tell you one of many anecdotes about her unique view of the world. It was around 1970, and I was driving her somewhere. We passed a gas station, and there was a new gas out, and it was called Total, T-O-T-A-L. And Raya saw, she began to shout, there you see how the capitalists understand. The totality is very attractive. Why can't our people get it? <laughs> we, well, we should probably follow up on this point about working at ideas uh, at some point in this interview. But first, um, let's talk about her opposition to capitalism. You know, what turned Dunyovskaya into a radical and, and when did that take place? Oh, well, she was born in the Ukraine, then part of the Russian Empire in, in 1910. Um, and so she was sort of a child of the Russian Revolution, although she was way out in the sticks. And it didn't come to her shtetl except in the form of they would be overrun by the Cossacks and the White Army and get massacred. And, and then the, the Red Army would come and chase them away, I guess. So um, that that made her a, a, a radical, that knowledge, as small as it was, for a young child in the Russian Revolution. And then, you know, later on she saw all the horrible uh, inequalities and, and oppression in the world. And she spent her life uh, trying to work out a Marxist response to that. Her family, after they fled the Ukraine, they eventually got a ship and got off in Chicago in the early 20s. And once she came to the U.S., she was a rebel, uh, even in elementary school. She led a student walkout. There's a picture of this in her archives at Wayne State University. The students are on ro roller skates, <laughs> and they've got protest signs, uh, and they were against corporal punishment and anti-Semitism and, um, at a young age. <clears throat> and she got very involved in African American American activities. That was always uh, a movement that she loved very much uh, since she arrived in the U.S. She began to work with Chicago organizations for African American civil rights and wrote book reviews for the local black newspaper and, and got very involved. She was also right away uh, as a teenager got involved with the Communist Party's youth organization, the Young Communist League. She participated in that until she was thrown out because the branch wanted to pass a resolution condemning Trotsky, and nobody even knew, you know, who Trotsky was or what he'd done or whatever. And she innocently asked, well, couldn't we wait till we get the documents from New York about what this is all about before we pass a resolution? So um, she was thrown out, actually, literally. She was picked up and thrown down the stairs. Yeah, I, I remember... Um reading uh, a letter by, by Dunyevskaya to Herbert Marcuse, you know, the philosopher, uh, and she described in that letter what the Stalinists did to her, you know, throwing her down the stairs and, and, and stuff. Um, it's not clear from the correspondence that he had any reaction at all to that. Um, but how did she react to being thrown down the stairs by the Stalinists? Oh, she picked herself up. <laughs> Well, found out where the Trotskyists were and took herself to New York <clears throat> and joined them. So she spent the next several years studying with the Trotskyists, studying Marx and Lenin and Trotsky and doing party work. Uh, they had to sell uh, skillion copies of the militant newspaper every week. She did that. She made speeches in Union Square in those days when that's where people went for their uh, discussion of revolution, Marxism. And 
and uh, and speaking of the communists, that when when she was in Union Square, there were other radicals there too, right? And the communists would go into the nearby buildings and throw bricks at her. So that wasn't too much fun. But the next thing she did was the, the Spanish Civil War, uh, which broke out in 1936. She decided that's where she had to be. So she applied to go fight uh, with one of the um, international brigades, but they wouldn't take her because she was a woman. Surprise. And that's when she decided to make herself useful and go to Trotsky in Mexico. And just in case listeners aren't familiar with the history, can you remind them what Trotsky was doing in Mexico? Uh, he was trying to survive, <laughs> avoid the Russian agents who were trying to kill him. He'd been exiled from the Soviet Union by Stalin, who was busy getting rid of all his, his rivals and eradicating the true history of the Russian Revolution. And the Mexican government, it was a socialist government, uh, they gave Trotsky refuge, and he got help. Diego Rivera lent him his house. It was a compound uh, with a wall, <clears throat> and the, you could place a guard in the corners of it. So so um, uh, Donevskaya taught herself Russian by going to the New York Public Library and studying it because she hadn't spoken it when she lived in a shtetl in the Ukraine. And then she went to Mexico, and it was not with the American Trotskyist Party's authorization. She just took herself and went in 1937. Uh, but she made herself very useful because he dictated in Russian, and so she became his Russian secretary, and she was very involved in his work for the next two years. That's kind of interesting. Uh, Trotsky accepted her even though she she wasn't there uh, under party auspices. Um, so sh- she was working as his Russian secretary. What what did that entail? What kind of work was she doing? Oh my God, that was crazy. Um... It was the period of the Moscow frame-up trials, if you all know your history. Stalin was killing off those leaders of the Russian Revolution by accusing them of having been uh, not really revolutionaries, but secret counter-revolutionaries, agents of the Tsar. Uh, So every day they would get uh, news of the latest accusations coming from Moscow about one person or another. And the sympathetic Mexican newspapers delayed publication of what the Russians had sent uh, so that Trotsky could respond in the same issue with the true story of what had happened. So he would read them, see the little kernel of one little true thing that had, you know, been used to legitimatize the story, and then he would dictate a response about what really happened. So Donevskaya learned to write very fast and type very fast. (laughs) She was a crackerjack typist, (laughs) and they would get the things off. She also did guard duty. Everybody took a, a turn at guard duty. Um, but since she couldn't she couldn't shoot straight, that was not uh, the most important thing she did. Um, she did get involved in security because when they went out, once in a while they'd be able to leave the, the compound and go somewhere. And when they did, she would walk in front of Trotsky. And people thought, oh, he's such a gentleman. He's letting the woman go first. But it was actually so that she could take a bullet for him if necessary. And one time, purportedly from a friend... They arrived at the compound, a wheelbarrow of dirt for the garden, and she checked it as she checked anything that came in and found a bomb. She stopped the bomb from going. So she had a lot of functions there. So she was there for two years with Trotsky, and then she returned to the U.S. Was that because she'd become disillusioned with Trotsky? Was that after the Hitler-Stalin pact? Um, no, she returned home to Chicago because there was a family tragedy and her family needed her. But Hitlerstein Pact had convinced her that the USSR could not be socialism. And she was to develop her theory of state capitalism at that time. Uh, and the state capitalism meant that in the USSR, anyway, there had been a merging of the state with the economic system. So it was not a new economic system. It was not socialism. It was just a statified form of capital. And Trotsky was still defending the USSR as a worker state, though degenerate, as they said. <clears throat> when she realized that she was so profoundly disagreeing with the leader of the Red Army, Trotsky, she, as she tells it, became so upset that she lost her ability to speak for three days. She couldn't say a word. Is that something she told you about? 
Oh, yes. She told me, she told a number of people, um, all of the anecdotes or whatever I'm telling about her were, were told me by her. Yeah, that particular uh, incident where she wasn't able to speak, I think it's something that she uh, also mentions in a, uh, a talk she gave when she was donating uh, volumes uh, of her archives to Wayne State University. I think she, you know, briefly mentioned that. Okay, so after concluding that Russia was not a worker state, uh, she develops this theory of state capitalism. Yeah, and she 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 saw that state capitalism was not a Russian thing. It was a tendency all over the world. This merging of of state and economics. Um, so there was the New Deal in the U.S. co-prosperity in Japan, as well as what was going on in the in the Soviet Union with the USSR. She never called it the Soviet Union because she considered that an insult to the Soviets, which had been great revolutionary vehicles um, and uh, were, uh, you know, lost with the advent of Stalinism. She called it Russia, which, of course, it is again now, or uh, USSR. Um, but as soon as she named R.H. State capitalism, uh, then she searched for the absolute opposite to that. Well, what's there's got to be a something really opposed to that. And so she, that's what she worked on in the 40s, as well as um, as well as elaborating her state capitalist the, uh, theory. Uh, and she looked around and she singled out the mass grassroots movements of her time uh, as that absolute uh, opposite. Uh, and she made it her principle and her practice uh, all her life to listen to what she called the voices from below, the um, uh, poor and unemployed people during the Great Depression, uh, the African-American freedom movements and youth movements all the time, uh, coal miners on strike in 1949-50, auto workers uh, organizing unions in the 1930s and 40s, and then uh, caucuses, um, black people within the unions against the union and the company in the 1960s, and then feminists who emerged to critique uh, all that exists we did in the 1960s and 70s. Yeah, it, when you were speaking, you mentioned this term absolute opposite that uh, I, I don't know every, if everybody's familiar with it. So you, you, you were saying that uh, she was searching out an absolute opposite uh, to state capitalism in Russia and as a tendency all throughout the world. What is it that you mean by absolute opposite, and what's the importance of searching for an absolute opposite? Oh, well, she didn't consider the U.S. and USSR to be the, uh, the opposites in the world, not the real ones, because both are state capitalist, as you said. An absolute opposite is one that's not conditioned by what you oppose. It's not just, I don't like that. Um, I instead, it's a it's a leap to something new. It's a, it's a free release of ideas and creativity and, and gets you to a whole new place. So that, and that's the sense of absolute absolute, um, from Hegel's absolute. And in her view, it was the masses of people who were struggling against both of those kinds of societies, uh, the workers, women, minorities, youth, etc. Uh, and she she searched for them because uh, being a Marxist and a Hegelian dialectician of sorts at this time, she, she knew that... Um, oppression generated its opposite, and that opposition was what would bring down uh, the oppressive society and build a new society. Can we go back to her theory of state capitalism for a moment? Um, this is something she developed in collaboration with C.L.R. James, right? Yes, uh, James had uh, reached the same conclusion she did uh, that uh, Russia was state capitalist at about the same time. And when she returned from Mexico, she intensified her study of, of Marx. And actually, she had a very serious car accident that laid her up for six months in bed. And so she couldn't go back to being a, a movement activist. Uh, and so she studied more Marx and she tackled Hegel. And she and James began to work together when uh, when he read her first essay about 
state capitalism uh, within the Workers' Party. And during the 1940s, they were known as the Johnson Forest Tendency and worked together in and out of the Trotskyist Party and the Shackmanite Party. And, um, and this went on until 1950 when they left the Socialist Workers' Party for good and they began to function as a, their own organization correspondence. And then that continued until 1955, when James and Donierskaya split up the organization. So the, what had been called the Johnson Forest Tendency, when it became an independent thing, it gave the tendency the, the name Correspondence, right? And so that existed for about five years. Yes. And then it split up. Okay. And, and why did it split up? Well, the immediate cause of the break um, was that James, who came from Trinidad, was deported from the U.S. to England uh, following uh, our government's listing of the Johnson Forest Tendency as subversive. And Donetsk wanted to fight the listing, but James did not. He wanted to go, yet he also wanted to keep control of their organization, which was only in the U.S., and he wanted to control it from afar. So those are the objective reasons for the split. But even more fundamental was that they had reached a philosophic divide between them. And whereas James had written on dialectics, he had stopped short of investigating Hegel's philosophy of mind. Donetskaya's study of Hegel um, around the same time as his, led her in 1953 to, quote, discover a new interpretation of Hegel's absolute, if I may say a few words about it. In her view, there's a two-way road between theory and practice. This is spoiling it down, sort of simplistically. But this dialectic between theory and practice would keep developing, each influencing the other, uh, until there came a, a leap to socialism. And this would leave behind the perennial split between theory and practice, which dominates all our lives and thoughts from whenever, beginning of time to through today. And we would then be able to, to enter a new realm and work out a new society where people would not be formed by the past, as Marx put it, uh, but are, quote, in the absolute movement of becoming. That's Marx's vision in the Grindrys. So for the rest of her life, Donevskaya called the two letters that she wrote in 1953 on Hegel's absolute, she called them the source of all her development of Marxist humanism as a philosophy. James, on the other hand, uh, never developed much beyond the spontaneous views that he held uh, at the time they split up and she insisted that philosophy had to be a, a major role in their organization and their work and he thought it was enough to be with the masses. So, um, if I can tell one little sort of example, when she, when they split and their co-leader Grace Lee, later Grace Lee Boggs, uh, went with James, and uh, one sort of example of the difference in attitudes them and Donevskaya uh, occurred when Stalin died in 1953, and Donevskaya immediately wrote a serious analysis of the situation, <laughs> world-shaking situation, right? who was going to take over, et cetera. And she immediately asked Charles Denby to come to her house. Charles Denby was the black auto worker who would be the ed editor of News and Letters newspaper from uh, the founding of their organization until his death. And she wanted to know what he and the workers in his in a shop were, were saying about Stalin's death. And he said, they said, oh, I have just the man to replace Stalin, my foreman. So Dennis Gaia thought that was really important, uh, that the Americans could see, the American workers could see through the, their government's uh, designations and see what was really going on. Uh, so she wrote this piece and she submitted it to the party newspaper uh, correspondence, but instead of initially publishing it, they published something else. Lee had reported that Selma James, a member of the organization, had reported from her shop uh, that the women, when the news of Stalin's death came over the radio, the women in the all-women's department of, of her factory had ignored the news, and instead they were exchanging hamburger recipes. And I suppose this was to show how much more in tune with reality were the workers than the intellectuals. Of course, it left out a very important dimension of reality, 
Yeah, they they would talk about the worker's way of knowing, and <laughs> ignoring Stalin's death is more like the worker's way of not knowing. It. But the contrast between what Demby reported and what Selma James reported, that really complicates the idea that Marxist revolutionaries, you know, should be with the workers, should be with the masses. I mean, which workers? Those who are paying attention, those who aren't. Those who took events seriously, those, those who didn't. So, so we're talking about then the split that actually, you know, comes past a couple of years later. When that split occurred, was it about this issue with the people that agreed with Dunyevskaya going with her and the people who disagreed going with James and Lee? Is that the way it uh, shook out? I wish it had been that clear cut. I, I wish that everyone who went with Donovskaya had been passionate about working on philosophy with her and the role of philosophy. And I don't know exactly what was said at that convention, uh, but I'm sure that it was not what that you and I would have liked to see. Because subsequent events revealed that everybody in both groups was pretty much uh, imbued with James' spont spontaneous views, that those views were embedded in everyone in the Johnson Forest tendency, and um, just about everyone since in, in any um, non-vanguardist uh, group. So Donayevskaya and her comrades formed news and letters committees uh, the same year. And it proved to be a, a profound disappointment to her, actually, from the start right up to her death in 1987. And I could document this with many uh, published and unpublished uh, letters in which, you know, y it breaks your heart um, how disappointed she was in her own people. Um, and I was privy to a lot of discussions of it. So she just continually had to fight our, our own members, James Ide ideas, and the same ideas in the anti-Stalinist left, which she had hoped would be won over to her philosophy of revolution, uh, but continued to marginalize her. So try as she might over the years to challenge the comrades to actually help in the development of the philosophy, which underlaid everything she was doing, uh, she was met by continuous resistance. And that was not just like the new people or something. The, the people who founded the organization with her, who came out of the same Trotskyist left, were just as resistant um, and are really... Uh, culpable for not being able to carry the organization on her path after her death. But then there was the next generation after them, which is my generation of the 60s, and we had a wonderful feel for the mass movements from below, as she called all the, the, the great grassroots movements, and uh, we were big activists in all those movements in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Well, I came in in the 60s. Uh, but we only made perfunctory nods to the role of theory. We left it to her. Theory was her department. And then there's another, you could say, generation after mine, the youngest, uh, most activist, spontaneist youth who mostly have no interest in philosophy, even if they claim to be Marxists. And we were all we younger people were all happy being super activists in movements of workers, women, youth, African Americans, and international solidarity movements. And we were happy to be activists and to write about those movements and to elicit stories from the participants for our newspaper and to report on them to Donetskaya. And this way we thought we were helping her develop theory, uh, particularly her, her theory that there's a movement from practice to theory as well as from theory to practice and that there's a, a two-way road um, akin to that in philosophy in her 1953 letters, but in actuality also. And, and so we, you know, we thought we were helping by telling her what was going on. And I suppose we did, but that meant that Marxist humanist practice, aside, aside from Dennis Guy, remained one-sided. And all these years later, Marxist humanist initiative is still struggling with the same problematic of how to act actually get everyone involved working on philosophy. It's just too big a task, and we don't have another Raya, and we don't have another Marx, so everyone needs to get serious about it, in our opinion. Nowadays, what people know about Dunia Sky is largely what they read in her theoretical work. She wrote three or four books, and these were all published after she broke with James and Lee, right? Oh, yes. Before the break, 
James was the big political theorist. She was supposed to contribute to his work on, on economics was her specialty, and, and Lee was supposed to contribute on philosophy. But when Don F. Sky wrote the 50, 1953 letters on Hegel's absolutes, and Lee got very enthusiastic about them, thought it was brilliant, James shut her down, and basically he shut Don F. Sky up. She was supposed to be assisting him. And it was all very sexist, too. She told me she used to sneak off to the women's restroom in order to have a few minutes by herself to think where he wasn't making demands on her. After the break with James, everything changed. Her new organization, at her insistence, immediately assigned her to write her a book. And that became her first book, uh, Marxism and Freedom. Uh, le let me say a word about her name, if I may. I, of course, called her Raya because I knew her, but I'm trying not to do that because it's, I think, sexist. We don't call Marx Carl or, or Lenin Vladdy, um, and it's only uh, Donevskaya and Rosa Luxemburg who are commonly called by their first names in the left. It's just their misfortune or ours that they have terribly long last names. <laughs> but um, I try to discourage people who didn't know her from calling her Raya. But since I did know her, I probably keep slipping into that. Yeah, and it's not the difficulty of the name. I mean, nobody goes around calling Panacock, which is not easy to say. No one yeah. goes around calling him Anton. I just call him Pancake. <laughs> so, Anne, you mentioned Dunyovskaya teaching herself Russian so she can make herself useful to Trotsky. And you mentioned her this like deep dive she takes into Marx and Hegel and Lenin and such. Um, you don't you didn't say anything about her, like, you know, going and getting a PhD in philosophy or economics or social sciences or something. Was she a complete autodidact? Yes, she was completely self-taught. Well, she did very well in, in high school, I guess. That gave her some foundation for reading and writing. But she never went to college. She never had any interest in going to college. She She taught herself, or Marx taught her. And this was this was another problem in the sense of her getting known and her getting recognized in the intellectual world. Because uh, far from being a professor, she never even had an undergraduate degree, and that was a reason to keep her out of the, you know, inner circle of, of Marxists. So it was a problem. But she was, you know, obviously extremely bright that she could do this on her own. You were saying that she she wrote th these books. This was the period after the split from C.R. James and Grace Lee. All, all of all of her books. And you said the first one was Marxism and Freedom. Can you let our listeners know briefly uh, what she was trying to do in that book and what its relationship is to her second book, which to a lot of people just seems like night and day. They seem like two very, very different books. Well, Marxism and Freedom came out in 1957. Her second book, Philosophy and Revolution, came out in 73. And um, she did a lot of searching for co-thinkers to help her with a second book. But in the end, she had to do it herself. Her first book is can be read as a history from 1776 to, to 1957. Um, but it's uh, history in the sense of history of ideas as well as history of men movements and it begins with the age of revolutions 1776 is the american revolution and it's also i'm sorry adam smith so she calls it the period of uh, the age of revolutions industrial social political and intellectual and then it ends with the 1950s uh, american workers struggles against automation and east european workers revolts against russian totalitarianism and prominent in the book is her analysis of the soviet union and those East European uprisings against it. Because the problematic of her age, what she's really addressing, you can you can feel is underlying everything, is the question, what happens after the revolution? In other words, before the Russian Revolution, you know, the main problematic was to get rid of the, the king or the dictator or the despot that was ruling you. But then when the Russian Revolution um, turned into its opposite, that was how she saw it. It had been a great revolution for freedom and turned into a, its opposite, a terrible totalitarian society. And so that sharpened for her the problematic of, of her age, and still our age, I think, um, uh, of what happens after the revolution. And what's unique in, in her book is 
her interpretation of some of Marx's ma major writings, uh, including his 1844 economic philosophic essays, or humanist essays, they're called. The first edition of Marxism and Freedom included the very first English publication of two of those essays, her translations, which are avail available on MHI's archives page. There's many other translations of them by now. So the book was and remains a profound challenge to the supposed dichotomy between U.S. capitalism and Russian state capitalism. I would say it's based on the depth of the human struggle for freedom against both, and Donerskaya hoped it would change the major discourse on the subject, because in those days you were either for or against the Soviet Union. But it didn't change major discourse. She was still marginalized by both communists who dominated the left actually and intellectually and uh, they tried to keep her out of a discussion. And um, on the other hand, there was the, the anti-communist right wing, age of McCarthyism. So she spent some years trying to find allies, including a trip she made to Africa in the uh, 60s during the colonial revolution in which she was uh, directly engaged with discussions with the masses who were making those revolutions. So her experiences with the movements complemented her theoretical, really. And she shared ideas with some very great thinkers, but none of them chose to throw in their lot with hers to dedicate their intellectual lives to, to uh, Marxist humanism. Um, that is a wonderful summary of Marxism and freedom. Why don't you go ahead and just start talking about her second book? Okay. Her second major work is called Philosophy and Revolution. It was published in 1973, and it begins with her truly unique interpretations of Hegel's concept of absolute negativity, and she deems this absolute negativity a, quote, new beginning, and that's the theme of everything in this book, although only the first chapter is directly on Hegel, but it's how you make a new beginning after the revolution. I mean, it doesn't say this is how you make a new beginning. This is my interpretation of what the book's about. After she takes up Hegel's absolute negativity, then she takes up Marx and Lenin, and then what she calls alternatives, Trotsky, <clears throat> Jean-Paul Sartre, and Mao Zedong. Then she takes up the East European revolts and the African revolutions. And she ends with the U.S. movements of the 1960s and early 70s, including the urban rebellions and some of the profound theoretic questions being raised by African-American movements and women's liberationists. So in News and Letters Committees, we used to say as sort of shorthand that Marxism and freedom was about the movement from practice theory, and philosophy and revolution was about the movement from theory to practice, but that's not really correct, and I shouldn't even say it again. <laughs> both books are about both movements in the dialectic, and particularly, quote, the truth uniting both. That is, that there's a single dialectic in thought and activity, and that alone can produce a revolution that will change everything. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at when I was referring to people who thought that these books were kind of like night and day. I appreciated that answer that the, the, both books are, are about both, but but in but in different ways. It's about a single dialectic, looking at it from two, two different vantage points. But with regard to the second book, Philosophy and Revolution, it came out in 1973, and you worked with Dunyevskaya uh, when she was writing it. What kind of assistance did you provide her, and what was that experience like for you? Oh, that was really the most exciting times in my life. I worked with her a few weeks at a time, for a few times, and when she would go away to a little house in the country so she could work continuously and was supposed to be free of organizational responsibilities, although she never really was. And what I did was take dictation, as she wrote. I typed it on the electric typewriter. And um, she would always ask me for my reaction to what she'd just written, and I'm afraid that uh, I couldn't be a lot of help with that. I just didn't have enough knowledge to really uh, add much. But in Chapter 9 of Philosophy and Revolution, I added a couple of paragraphs because that's the one on the mass movements of the 1960s and early 70s. And she takes up, among other things, the new women's liberation movement, which I was very active in. So she asked me to write a few paragraphs for the book, and I did. Working with her was an intense experience. She worked morning, afternoon, and evening, 
And then she wrote corrections on the t typed pages we had done. And she wrote by hand, she had terrible handwriting. And then periodically, uh, when I would uh, take a weekend off and go to Detroit, um, where I lived, she would give me the finished pages to take home uh, to the typist who was producing the manuscript. So I would look over what she'd handwritten to make sure the typist was going to be able to read it. Um, but the problem was, if I asked her what a word was, simply because I couldn't make it out, she would take the paper out of my hands and she would add a whole new paragraph <laughs> to, to, to explicate it or to change the idea because her thinking had gone further or something. And sometimes she would have to tape a scrap of paper uh, onto the original page with her new the new things she'd add. Added. And so the pages had long tails on them. It was quite interesting to see. I'll tell you uh, another thing about working with her. It's not terribly important, but <laughs> I, it still gives me uh, a trepidation. The country house was in Canada, you know, across the river from Detroit. And on one of my stays there, Canada had just declared a, a state of emergency because uh, there was the Quebecois separatist. separatist activities going on, so Canada had suspended civil liberties, which made me very nervous when I had to cross the border between the two countries, carrying the only copy, only copy, right? No Xerox machine, no computer, uh, of the completely finished pages. So I was always worried I'd be searched and her work confiscated. Uh, and in spite of this, uh, Raya always insisted that I take home something she had cooked, in spite of my protestations that I didn't want to be stopped at the border for carrying food and have the manuscript on me. Well, I always lost the argument, and I always had to take the food with the manuscript. So after philosophy and revolution, what did she decide to focus her attention on? Well, the third book of what she termed her, quote, trilogy of revolution, her most important works, is called Rosa Luxemburg, Women's Liberation and Marxist Philosophy of Revolution, and that came out in 1983. And she took up Luxemburg partly in order to show the new feminist movement uh, that there was a great woman Marxist revolutionary who was a profound theorist, not just great at organization and activity and stuff. I think Danierskaya hoped to inspire feminists to follow in the path of Luxembourg and herself and become Marxist theoreticians. So she brought out Luxembourg's feminist dimension, which until then had been largely ignored. But she also critiqued Luxembourg's theoretic differences with Marx. In other words, she showed Luxembourg as a whole human being, uh, a passionate intellectual um, and, uh, and an activist, but also and mainly a theorist. And then the second part of the book on the women's liberation movement is she's demonstrating the movement's passion to remake society on new human grounds. Again, it's not what she says, it's what she does. She quotes some of the, the best ideas from the new women's movement. And particularly on the theme of what it means to be a person, again, a whole person, and not one who's stuck in what you are, not defined by your, your conditions that made you what you are, uh, but instead to, your struggles to become something new. So it's very analogous to the concepts of in Marx's 1844 humanist essays, I think. So she has a lot of quotes. In fact, the first chapter of that part is almost all quotes from, from new feminist and feminist groups. And the feminists love book, at least that part of it. Um, people even said, oh, she expressed their movement better than they could do themselves or had done themselves. Unfortunately, however, affinity with many of Donevskaya's ideas, whether about human nature, possibility of self-development, man-woman relations, all these things, affinity with them did not lead many women to delve into Marxist philosophy, at least not into her Marxist humanism. And the so-called Marxist organizations remain very male to this day. Day, not to mention very dismissive of Marxist humanism. The final section of that book is another return to Marx, this time to some of his, of his barely known writings on human relations in ancient and primitive societies. And it again illuminates the same central issue of what we are and what we might be. 
by showing that, uh, well, as I put it, this is, again, not her words, my characterization, that the only thing that um, never changes in human development is the impulse for human development. That's the continuous basis of, of human thought and life. So, so what else did she write after those three books? Uh, well, her fourth book, it's a collection of her past uh, short writings, and it's called Women's Liberation and the Dialectics of Revolution, Reaching for the Future. And it takes up women in China, Latin America, all over, um, things she'd written about over the years, but in each case tied to a particular struggle that women are having. And again, in my view, it relates to a principle of Marxist humanism, uh, these uh, abiding themes about the struggle for freedom, uh, whether you're fighting discrimination by your husband's employers or whoever. And I also want to mention one earlier book, 1963. It's actually a pamphlet called American Civilization on Trial. And she wrote it at the beginning or height of the black liberation movement uh, of the 60s. And it's on the history of African Americans in the U.S. and the high points historically that were reached when their struggles coalesced with the multi-ethnic working class movement. Uh, so you had this great uh, struggle for advances and you had actually leaps in like, a unionization, a populist movement for a while, etc. And she considered this pamphlet so important important that she put it on a bar with the trilogy of her books, spoke of it as her as a fourth main work. And then she wrote all the time for journals, for correspondence with people, uh, Hegelian scholars who weren't even Marxist, she would challenge with her ideas, or challenge her own ideas on Hegel, check them with them. So she wrote and published on, on all these subjects, and in fact, her archives of writings and letters and drafts of her unfinished book contain over 15,000 pages, and that's in addition to her published books. Um, and those archives are at Wayne State University, Labor History archive uh, and, and are available digitally. So today, if you want to find her writings, there's quite a bit on our web website. We have in our select page writings, and there's quite a bit on uh, Marxist.org and elsewhere. But if you want to understand the foundation and the totality of her ideas, I recommend the, the three books I just discussed as the trilogy. And um, right now, MHI is not able to fill book orders, but you can get them from us later, or you can uh, find newer used copies of her books on Amazon or Abe Books and in libraries. But she was uh, still working uh, at the time of her death. She was working on a book that she uh, was not a not able to complete. Um, what can you tell us a a about that? Okay, that's very important. She was working on a new book on the dialectics of organization and philosophy when she passed in 1987. And she considered organization to be the area of theory that had not been developed at all by Marxists after Marx. She said there'd been a void ever since Marx's critique of the Gotha program, 1875. Uh, and she said this, this urgently needs to be filled. So what we have is uh, a lot of notes from her and little fragments of, of uh, what might have been used in the book. And es uh, essentially what she was doing was Rather than posing the vanguard party and spontaneity as opposite forms of organization, her notes for the book treat them, treat them as opposite sides of the same coin. In other words, both replicate the divide between thought and activity that characterizes capitalist society. And here we are again with the real opposite. <laughs> as we had discussed previously. The real opposite of both the vanguard and spontaneity, she insisted, was a new concept of organization, one that arises out of and corresponds to Marx's philosophy. And this challenge definitely remains unmet. Yeah, I mean, you, you were speaking about how, uh, you know, uh, she went around the world, she went to Africa, she went to Europe, trying to find allies, trying to find co-thinkers, people to get behind and help her with Marxist humanism. Uh, and she reached out to the feminists who appreciated the, her appreciation of them. Uh, but again, uh, she didn't find real allies there in terms of working out Marxist humanism. 
Um, and it seems to me this has to do with the fact that people, again and again, split uh, theory and practice, and especially they split ideas and organization, you know. Uh, and this has been something that's happened in the whole history uh, of Marxism. I mean, you know, people liked Marx's ideas, they appreciated them, but organizationally, you know, these people were prodonists. Uh, and then later they appreciated Marx as a theorist, but they established these so-called Marxist political parties that were built on the foundations of Ferdinand LaSalle. You know, and then, you know, people appreciate uh, Marx, they appreciate uh, Dunyaskaya, but what do they do politically? You know, they capitulate to Stalinism, they, they collaborate with Stalinism, uh, they remain in Trotskyist organizations, or you know, they just otherwise refuse to join her in putting her ideas into practice organizationally, although they say, oh, we, we love this stuff. You know, and now we've got, I mean, today, We've got all kinds of people who are, you know, supposedly loving Dunyevskaya's ideas, but when you look at what they're doing politically, they're collaborating with Monthly Review, they're collaborating with uh, Jacobin, you know, they're collaborating with the remaining followers of C.L.R. James or whatnot. Um, so I, the, the question that plagues me all the time is why is there such this, why is there such a wide separation between theory and practice and between philosophy and the organizational expression of philosophy, including among people who claim to agree with Dunyevskaya on the need for a new unity of theory and practice. I mean, this it's just a complete divorce of theory and practice and philosophy and organization. Why is this happening? I mean, what can be done uh, about this problem? Well, that's the $64,000 question. MHI is trying to create a new kind of organization that doesn't have that separation between theory and practice. But they know simple answers. You have to remember that for however many million years that there have been human beings, there's been this split between thinking and doing, between theory and practice. It, it might be something in our brains we have to overcome to be able to see totality, to be able to see the two-way road between theory and practice. I don't know, but I do know it's going to take a lot of very hard mental labor by a lot of people to even begin to build an organization that's capable of assisting uh, the work class and other revolutionary subjects, not just to make a revolution, but to make one that actually transforms society, doesn't fall back into capitalism. So MHI can't offer you a program or a formula or a plan. All we can offer is a challenge that you join us and do a lot of hard, hard work on the hardest problems that exist. And what you get in return is the chance to help the, the working class uh, build a human society one day. Well, that seems like a good closing statement if I ever heard one. So, uh, Anne, thank you for being with us on Radio Free Humanity today. Well, thank you very much. I'm always happy to talk about Donievskaya and uh, MHI. Yes, thank you very much. And of course, it would not be an episode of Radio Free Humanity without Anne reading our Who We Are statement. So let's hear it. Hello, this is Anne Jacquard, Organizational Secretary of Marxist Humanist Initiative. Marxist Humanist Initiative, or MHI, aims to contribute to the transformation of this capitalist world by projecting, developing, and concretizing the philosophy of Karl Marx and its further development in the Marxist humanism articulated by Raya Donayevskaya. We are not a political party, nor are we trying to lead the masses whose emancip emancipation must be their own act. But we have seen that spontaneous actions alone are insufficient to usher in a new society. We seek a new unity of philosophy and organization in which mass movements striving for freedom lay hold of Marx's philosophy of revolution and recreate society on its basis. Today's political, economic, and environmental crises present a moment to engage people in discussion of these ideas. MHI is dedicated to the task of proving theoretically that an alternative to capitalism is possible, 
We are distinguished by our economic analyses, which demonstrate that the only opposite to the current world economic system is its abolition and replacement with one not based on the production of, quote, value. Because capitalism cannot be fundamentally reformed, attempts to reform it lead to an intensification of state capitalism, not socialism. MHI's ideas and actions, as well as our structure and rules, are guided by the interests of working people and freedom movements of people of color, LGBTQ people, other minorities, youth, and all those around the world who are struggling for self-determination in order to freely develop their own human natures. We have no interests separate and apart from theirs. We intend to practice, as well as espouse, a two-way road between our organization and people outside it as essential to developing a single dialectic in the relationship of theory to practice. That's all the time we have for today's episode. If you like the podcast, please do share it and spread it around. Tell your friends, rate it, leave us some comments. We'd love to hear from you.